Linda Bird, the chair, and I would like to make a special welcome to um, Detective Chief Superintendent David Blair. No, I've got that wrong. I'm so Detective Superintendent David Blair. It says it in big letters. I should be able to see it. This is a, this is a very special time, and we're very grateful that you've come along to us today. Um, with that in mind, before we start, I think it'd be really good if members of the panel could introduce themselves so that you know who's here. So if we could start on my, on my right, please. Councillor Asli Mohammed from Village Stockyard Ward. Councillor Joshua Ayadele from Village Arsenal Ward. Um, Pauline Sheath and I'm the uh, Church of England representative on the committee. Sorry, Samantha, the scrutiny officer. Uh, I'm Sammy and I represent uh, Eltham Town and Avery Hill. Um, hello, good evening. I'm Councillor Pat Greenwell and I represent one of the other councillors that represent Eltham Town and Avery Hill. Thank you. I'm Nicholas Rothson and I represent the Catholic Church. Thank you, and that's our scrutiny panel. Uh, we have now returning to the agenda. Um, we have apologies from Councillor Callum O'Bine, who's possibly Mulligan, who's going to be late, maybe. But I haven't heard anything from Councillor Thorpe. He may still be on his way, I don't know. Um, so back to the agenda and item two. Um, urgent business. Um, there is no real urgent business as far as I'm aware. Um, and declarations of interest, item three. Councillor Mohammed. I'm just being placed on a temporary um, assignment in Shooters Hill, um, six formers. Any more declarations of interest? I don't think so. Thank you. So could we move to the minutes of the previous meeting in June, please, um, for accuracy? Um, does everyone agree these are an accurate record of the meeting? I think there were quite a few people not here. Okay. All agreed? Thank you. Right, I can sign those then. Okay, so we're going to move straight on to item five, which is the Youth Justice Inspection Report um, from HMIP. Um, so I'm going to take great pleasure in handing over to Jennifer, Jennifer Williams, Head of Family and Adolescent Support um, at the YOS, and, um, and to Detective Superintendent Dave Blair, who I'm sure can take us through some of the issues there. Thank you very much. The panel have received the report. So thank you, Jennifer, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everybody. So um, thank, you, thank you for reading through the report. I'm gonna just take us through some of the key aspects of the report. And I'm particularly going to talk about the Youth Justice Inspection, which uh, happened in March, and um, also one of the other areas I'd like to talk about is the first time entrance. So um, I'm not going to go through the report sort of line by line, but I'm just going to draw out some of the key highlights from the inspection, um, which is dis dis discussed in the report. So as many, many of you may, may know, the um, inspection covers three key areas, uh, governance and leadership, court work, and out of court. And there was also a special area around resettlement as well. Um, I think one of the things that I really want to highlight is the good, the good judgment that we got as an overall judgment for our inspection, which was an absolutely tremendous achievement. One of the um, other things that I'm particularly proud of is um, we got two elements that were um, identified as outstanding. And that was specifically around our staff um, and some of the comments there in terms of being an aspirational service um, and also the other area that was outstanding was around our um, information and, uh, and technology and that's a big credit to the work that our colleagues in the performance anal analysis team do so that was really recognized 
by um, the inspectors. I'm going to just read out a couple of little statements for you in just in terms of some of the outstanding um, things that were highlighted. So for the staff, they spoke about being committed and knowledgeable and in, a, in an innovative staff group. They found really good management oversight in our, in our work, which was really good. Um, and the, the other area that we're particularly proud of was our response to the diverse needs of our children, which they, again, they felt that that was really good work as well. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, the other outstanding, uh, in terms of the information, that was some of this, the work there, really, really great work that they spoke about in terms of the, again, around the diversity and how that was really um, well, well captured and arrangements for, um, for contact with children responsive to the needs of our children. Uh, so I'm not going to go through line by line, but just some really key points there that I really wanted to, to highlight to you. As you would have seen through the report, um, so throughout the report, our judgments were, um, were, were good in all of the three areas. Now, the out-of-court area was an area that I'm sure that you've had, had sight of, where there were elements of that, that um, one element was in, in, inadequate, one area was requires improvement. And um, I'm sure some of you may, may want to talk to me a little bit about that. What I really do want to uh, draw your attention to, though, is actually that when the, uh, the assessments of that work is, is completed, the actual delivery of work was actually judged as outstanding. And um, there was a little bit of, um, uh, what's the word? A, bit, a, a, bit, a little bit of, we had some discussions with our youth justice boards, uh, with, with the inspection colleagues, because there's a little bit of discrepancy, I feel, in terms of how the inspectorates see things and how the youth justice boards see things. You know, we certainly come from a, you know, it's a, a child's first principle. That is that is that is what the youth justice board, um, you know, that is, that is the priority of the youth justice board. And there are some elements, I would say, of the inspectorate who may not have caught up with some of the aspects of our work. So um, that... Jennifer, can I just explain a little oh, bit? Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, it's just sort of for clarity. These are the same children that were assessed. So in that judgment, and um, these are the pre-court judgment, same children assessed. The assessment was deemed to be inadequate partly because we weren't using the exact risk assessment that the Youth Justice Board and the Inspectorate donate, uh, dictate to us that we should be using. We used our own assessments. The planning and the work was very good. The outcomes for those same children were outstanding. So the workers were do, making good assessments, making good judgments, but it wasn't on the format and on the paper that the inspectors liked to see. So they, that's why they it's a tick kind of box exercise as you go down. It ended up getting aggregated as an inadequate, but the outcomes for those very same children are outstanding. So just wanted to give you real clarity about that, that um, it's, it's not different children that they were looking at, it's the same cohort of children that they were looking at throughout their journey, um, and, and that's how the scoring came out. Thanks ever so much. Well, we're, we're determined to make sure as the outcomes are outstanding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, and thanks ever so much. And that is, you know, for us, that is actually key mm -hmm. for us, actually, the work, you know, when we get in and do the great work with our children, it, it is outstanding. So I'm going to take a little pause there just to um, invite any comments from anybody, any questions, before I move on to the first-time entrants. Right, thank you, Jennifer. That's, um, that's good. And, you know, the purpose of this panel is not only to dig down and scrutinise, but also to share the celebration. We understand from the report that there's, there's no question that the staff are giving um, a, a good service, but there is always a, an area that causes concern. And of course, we're not involved in that, so our scrutiny comes from that angle. And our first time entry um, queries are there. Um, my first observation was, um, and I can't find where I saw this now, but there was, there was mention of a triage um, in, in the system, how, um, particularly in terms of mental health and emotional well-being. So we have a young person or a child coming in as a first-time entry, and then there's a mention of triage. What, what is this, and how, how on earth will it be done? Um, and is this maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but is this to include outside agencies such as CAMS, which we know all around us is already overloaded? So I don't, I don't 
you know, it was that word triage that I think I would like some clarity on. Can you help? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. So just for, um, for, for our colleagues, so triage is part of the, the process, the criminal justice process, so it's one of a number of disposals that we have for our children. Um, so that, that's, what, that's what a triage is. It's not the actual, it's not the actual um, you know, triage in the sort of health, health sense, if that makes sense. Cam, we have a, a seconded Cam's worker into the service, and that worker makes an assessment on all children who are known to the youth justice system. If it's felt that they need an intervention from that CAMS worker, they'll do that intervention. If it's felt it needs a referral to CAMS, they'll do that referral. But we do have a dedicated mental health support for that. Triage is a completely separate part of the work. It's a pre-court part of the work in which um, uh, the decision-making process in whether a child has a conviction or an out-of-court disposal as part of that triage one of the things that the inspectors did find in, in the work was those children who were being worked with who weren't in the yacht system, who were being worked with by Charlton Athletic or by FAS, didn't have access to that same CAMS worker at all times. I think that was that's, fair to say. And we've correct. changed that now, we, haven't we? we, we have and we've indeed. made sure that every single young person who is known to the youth offending service in its broadest sense, and so not just the yacht, but the broadest sense, has that access to that CAMS worker. It's a seconded post into our service. Thanks, thanks yeah. for that clarification. Pauline. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the re report. Um, I'm looking at the uh, item six of the recommendations yeah. and the reference to um, access facilities that are compatible with working with children with neurodivergent conditions and I just wonder if you could explain exactly how that is going to be addressed yeah. and also to answer how much training in neurodivergency um, people who are dealing with these children have got and I noticed that there is some recommendation that there is going to be training on uh, neurodivergency done and I just wonder if you can explain a bit more about that, please. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, so actually, we had our first um, bit of training last week. So we had some, co some colleagues um, from um, speech and language, and they came and did some work with, our, with our, um, the whole service and then the way day. So that's the first stage of it. Um, the recommendation, as you quite rightly, rightly say, it spoke about um, access to facilities that um, are compatible with neurodivergence. And what we have done, we've um, started entering some considerations with ARC, our new residential unit um, for that to be a place where we can see some of our neuro neurodivergent children. Um, also, our youth hubs have, um, have sensory uh, rooms as well, and so it's about us making sure that we use those that, that are um, available. Uh, we've also um, have invested in, um, you know, like finger spinners as well, so these are some other, other sort of tools that we've, um, we've, um, we're, we're using. Um, so there's some of the key things that we've already done um, and we, as I say, we've had one training session with um, colleagues um, around neurodivergence and we've got another follow-up um, in, I think it's November. Councillor Greenwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Can I just ask, it's 4.8, which talks about post-school age children who are not in education or employment or training um, as being highlighted as you know, an area that can be improved. Um, I know that this, it was June when this report sort of was, came out, but what is, are we sort of doing anything to improve that? Thank, thanks, Councillor um, Greenwell. Yes, so in terms of that work, then we've um, had lots of discussions with the, um, the Youth Justice Board the, the, and um, MOPAC as well, and they have just um, developed a mentoring service um, called Sparks to Life, and so we will be um, using that mentoring service, but the, sorry, sorry, the mentoring service specifically for post-16 uh, children and provides opportunities across London. Um, so, for example, there's um, some stuff with clothing companies, events companies. So that's one, one area that we'll be particularly doing some, some work with. Uh, we've also um, doing some training around getting some bespoke um, CSE cards. So these are the, the cards that um, 
used for sort of builders and, and tradesmen as well. So we're going to do some bespoke work with our young people um, um, around construction to help them into construction. So that's some of the early discussions that, we, that we've had around addressing that. But obviously there's still, there's still more work to do around that, but we, we have already started those discussions. Add to that, we've also changed some of the arrangements of the Youth Justice Management Board and had, uh, have a subgroup that we've now dedicated. So Jane Lawley, who many of you know, um, will lead that subgroup that's looking specifically at education, training and employment to try and really sort of fast track an improvement in that area for post-16. Sorry, it's just how do you, I know it's a difficult one, but how do you cope with, with these children, teenagers who don't want any help? Have you got any specialists to, to help them? Or, or the police, can they sort of get involved with... Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question, and without a doubt, you know, there are some, some young people that, you know, we have to use lots of different skills and, and um, to engage them. But I, I do think, and the, and the report does reflect that, that actually we use a lot of innovation. So people will may be familiar with our arts project. That has certainly been a really, really innovative way in, in engaging many children that we previously had. And it's not just painting arts, we've got, um, it's spoken word as well. Um, so this, you know, that's one of the creative ways. Um, but also what we've done, um, in, just for this, this summer period, we um, allowed our staff to, um, to take the lead in terms of some of those activities and, and budgeting for things and speaking to their young people in terms of what they really wanted to do. And again, we've had some really tremendous results in terms of them just coming up with ideas themselves. Um, and because the staff have got the budgets, it's almost sort of giving them that, that sort of trust and not having to come back to management to oversee that. So again, that's been some, some sort of creative ways that we've managed to uh, get some of those um, you know, more um, you know, difficult young people that we haven't been able to engage before. So, thank you. As Councillor Mohammed, my question is a bit complex, to, um, <laughs> but uh, it's nothing new to you, I'm sure. Um, I know that we often write, and it's quite standardised um, when we write equalities. There is no apparent impact. Sorry, can I just, I just Sorry, am I not speaking on the... I know we often write on the reports, um, and it's quite standardised, you know, there is no apparent um, equality impact on the end users. There's always, always, um, equal, you know, impact on the, uh, on the end user. Um, we, you know, it, so where, where I'm, what I'm talking about in terms of when a youth... Um, go th you know cult certain cultures when they go through the youth um ju you know through the system how are those needs you know the how those their needs are met you know how are you meeting their cultural needs their um, religious needs and stuff like that because the reason why i ask that is my own in my own culture in you know i've done i've recently done a workshop where 130 people turned up here um, and there will be a report coming out, and part of that will be addressing pe young people within our um, culture that's gone through the youth um, um, justice system, and how they were f treated, how they, you know, supported and stuff like that. Um, so, the, and the, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of that process. So, I just want to know how you you addressing the different cultures needs and religion needs for those particular communities thank you uh, really, really really another great uh, that's cool. yeah no, that, thanks thanks for that question and you know we you know i'm sure um around the table be familiar that there's a lot of work that we are um, doing not just in in um, in greenwich but obviously um nationally in terms of um, readdressing the, the balance in terms of disproportionality. So a very, um, a, a very in-depth report was published um, um, not that long ago um, about Just Fair, and it talked about all those, some of those different elements that you spoke about. So this has obviously been shared with our Youth Justice um, Management Board. We've done so, um, uh, you know, from the top, we've done some work, um, and we have a very, very, very robust diversity action plan, um, and that, that, that particularly um, um, 
sorry, excuse me, that particularly addresses our, all of our partners in terms of what our, our partners are doing around um, this portability in certain, you know, different, different areas. So that's from the, you know, from the strategic level. In terms of our staff, our staff group, um, we have um, commissioned training. So we've had training um, around whole, uh, diversity. I mean, all of our young people, obviously, we go through a very thorough assessment which addresses you know, all, those different um, all those different areas around religion, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's some of the sort of top, the sort of top level stuff. Um, but we, you know, we have lots of, you know, we do lots and lots of training around, I won't go through all the sort of each one, but we, we have lots and lots of training on um, diversity, on difference, on um, you know, speech and language, on, on all those sort of different needs. So I, I, and again, the report, the inspection report, again, commended, commended us on that as, as a youth justice service. And I am particularly proud of that because actually, um, there are many youth justice services where um, there, there's a, that's a theme in terms of not being addressed. So the fact that the, actually, the inspectors actually noted that and highlighted that, that, you know, that for me shows that we really, we're in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation and the report. Um, I think, uh, Florence, you answered this question, but for clarity, it's relating to the risk assessments that are made, um, and it's on page 40. So there was a point there about we identified an underestimation of the classification of safety and well-being in too many cases. So is that relating to the point you're making? And then if so, just for clarity then, um, are we saying that, let's say the, rep the, the review was done again in October, that it'd be entirely different findings no. or perhaps in a year's time, now we use a different risk assessment? I would say in a year's time, because we're literally in that process of just rewriting our policy. Um, just actually today, we went and visited some, some other youth justice services where they'd got outstanding in their, um, in their out of court bit. So we, and we, we have a, um, a half away day in October when we're going to be looking at that whole out of court. So, um, I, I, you know, I have to be honest, I wouldn't say now, but we certainly, we've already made some changes. Um, and certainly, you know, given, given that feedback from the visits, and the rewriting of the policy, I, I, I do feel quite confident that if they came back in a year, they would see things differently. Cool. And just a supplementary question. On case managers specifically, I mean, across the board, do we feel that the standard is, I mean, very good? Or perhaps are there still discrepancies across the, the board on that? No, no, I, no I, I feel very, very confident that our standard is very, very good, 100%. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. I, I, as, um, as Florence pointed out, for me, this is just, it was just a bit of a um, technical issue with HMIP and, um, and the Youth Justice Board. And interestingly, it is something that other Youth Justice Services have, have picked up that we need our HMIP to sort of catch up a little bit with our practice. If our outcomes hadn't been outstanding, we would be worried. But if the outcomes are outstanding, that showed we have addressed risk in the, in the uh, work with the children and young people, and we have helped them stop offending. So that's the outcomes. They're in school or in employment or training, or their, their family life is better, or they've stopped offending. So the outcomes were outstanding. Um, I think um, if no one minds, I'd like really to address Detective Superintendent Blair. And I wonder, I don't want to put you on the spot or at, at all, the panel, but we've got you here and it's um, a bit of a treat for us. And I wondered if, if you wouldn't mind giving your perspective from the police's point of view on the um, relationship with the first time entry pupils. I mean, the report says a lot and, and applauds a lot, which is good. And the inspection came out very well. But you've got your feet on the ground and your officers have got the feet on the ground. And we'd like to just hear if you've got any comments that you'd like to add or anything you'd like to share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to the panel. Uh, it's, um, it's my first one of these and I am uh, only acting detective superintendent at the moment. So um, my previous boss would have been the, the gentleman that you were dealing with previously, which was Danny Gosling. So he sends his apologies, but he's retired now. So it's uh, important to me to do the duties. It's an interesting question, actually. Um, and 
it's one of those situations where the further up the, the management chain you go, the further away from some of the more operational elements of policing you become. Um, you become very much bogged down into policy, but these, but then you do get the opportunity to affect some positive change sometimes, which is also which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, from the first time entrance point of view, uh, I think the, pre the themes that from inside the Metropolitan Police, as I would understand them, would be largely training and experience. Um, we have a phenomenally inexperienced workforce um, who often are being uh, trained in their, if you like. Um, more fundamental core policing skills by officers who themselves have only a fraction of the two years of service that you might expect um, more experienced officers to have. So a lot of the time they're not necessarily uh, wholly familiar with the disposal options that are available to them. Um, custody facilities are very busy and um, intense environments. And it's not always the best learning experience for them to, if you, for example, if they were to bring a young person into custody for the first time, I wouldn't necessarily, it would be nice if I could expect, but I don't necessarily expect the custody officers to be in a position to mentor them as to the options that they might have for, for example, out of court disposals. So I think at the point of entry, um, it, there's still a lot to be done in terms of work that we can do as an organization to maybe, um, improve the level of understanding of the things that we have as a you know as a kind of a, if you like a menu of options that we can present uh, i think it, i think certainly from things have changed drastically from when i was a uniform officer but they they were we also have a, a fairly binary mindset around options um which is now changing significantly um certainly when i was bringing people into custody with reg, with, with any kind of regularity it was all, it, there was only ever a judicial disposal. It was very much a case of that was what you were working towards as a, as, a, as a point of, you know, that was the kind of, if you like, end product to the process, um, or a bail, obviously, and, and so on. But the, the end result was always going to be a judicial disposal. We've moved away from that particular perspective fairly recently and largely off the back of the Casey report. We are now focusing significantly more on positive outcomes, which might seem like a semantic change. But actually, if you think it through, um, it's quite, it's, you're asking for quite a significant amount of cultural change there as well, and a, and, a, and a fairly fundamental mindset shift. If you are going from the point of a judicial, judicial disposal, rightly or wrongly, to a positive outcome, simply the use of the language is quite key and important as far as I'm concerned. And I think it opens up that menu significantly in terms of if we have somebody in custody, why are they there? Can we, you know, have we thought about the, the kind of, you know, have we even addressed the fundamental bits and pieces that have brought them to that point? You know, a lot of the time it's, it's, it's a very straightforward and simple process for, for police officers. It seems very, like I say, very binary black and white situation. But then there seems to be an awful lot of the time there's little um, thought or maybe research gone into the, the events that have brought the individual to that point in custody. Another point is, um, timing and so on as well which is a bit more of a technical issue I, I suppose the issue for us would be for a first time entrant um, if we don't have some of the more uh, traditional intelligence databases that we would normally rely on for example a police national computer which would give us antecedents or any of our intelligence base databases which might provide us with some basis to formulate a trajectory of how that individuals came into custody uh, if we th in the absence of that, we'd be very much falling back onto our partners. And if we have somebody in custody in the middle of the night, for example, it's not always necessarily possible for us to access the background that we might be able to uh, or might like to have um, in order to make those decisions slightly more um, freely, I suppose, would probably be the best way to put it. Sorry, could I just ask you about the, the partnership? The, what you're saying is, is really interesting, and, and I think it's what the panel would appreciate hearing, and thank you for sharing the fact that we know that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of relationships and, and building trust um, is always important. But if you, with, with uh, our police force, uh, is there a tendency to use partnerships, say, if we're looking at differences in culture and differences in religion, is there a tendency, is there a hope that, that partnerships are used with local mosques and with um, any other um, cultural groups that you, you can access in order to support the work, so, you know, when, when young people appear? Um, is, is that partnership exist, does it? 
we have, uh, uh, you know, we obviously access our, um, the kind of the youth offending service by our yacht teams, which are a, a multi-agency team. So we, we do have access through that particular route. Um, in terms of whether or not, you, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're, you're asking whether or not we would go um, to, if you like, to um, partnership agencies in isolation as the police. Um, a lot of work's been done to um, improve our neighbourhood links and our, uh, you know, and, and kind of go back to a, a more, I don't know, um, holistic approach to neighbourhood policing. That would certainly be a part of that. I would expect to see much more of that. Whether or not that's happening at the moment is probably a different question. Um, or if it is, it's probably not happening to the extent that it needs to. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, you know, we're a community and we need to work together. Um, that's interesting. Um, I do want to say a big thank you uh, on behalf of the panel. There's a lot of work here and a lot of work going on um, um, from the police too. Um, and so I want to leave this item, but uh, um, I would like any members of the panel, if you've got one last question for anybody. Councillor Backham. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks again for the report. I was leaving my question because I think previously you were going to go on to talk about entrance. Um, I could have been reading this wrong, but I was quite shocked at that 92% of entrants to the um, youth justice system were male. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't expect that at all. Like, I knew males would have a higher proportion, but I think 92% is so high. And I guess I'd like to just hear about the work that is being done to target the male population or, or young males to prevent them entering the youth justice system um, when we know that's such a high proportion of demographic that enter it, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, I mean, that is um, quite a national picture that we tend to have males um, in, in more. I'm not sure if that's a policing thing, about whether we're a bit more... A bit more kind with the ladies, but it is, but it is, that is quite, that is quite general. But in terms of just in answering your question, uh, so the work with our uh, family and adolescent services, they do a lot of that pre, you know, pre youth justice, pre official youth justice, Lo lots of different um, group work. So we, um, there was one where we you know, took groups of male, young men to the uh, theatre to, to look at a particular. I don't know what the production was, but there was some sort of male production. They did a piece of work on that. Some of the artwork that we've got has done is, is been done specifically with, with some male groups. So that's some some of the specific work that we're doing on for sort of targeted groups. The work in Charleston Athletic. Oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. They're doing a lot of work so there yeah. as well. So the yeah. youth service Thank are you. doing lots of work with young men. Thank and you. And our schools as well. Lots of schools have various different projects and uh, various work and uh, I know that some of the schools I haven't got a list on top of my head but they're doing lots of work as well more to be done though yeah, always. cheers thank you, thank you. Um, I think we just take two more questions and then that's it got to be it yeah thanks sir. chair um, I was going to ask that you mentioned about a turnabout or a turnaround project um, which is being rolled out to schools perhaps you could tell us a bit more information about what that is and what it entails. Yeah, of course, yeah. So the Turnaround uh, Project, this is a, this is a, this is a really um, exciting project. And uh, Turnaround works with children on the edge of the criminal justice system. Um, and they can work with them for a longer period of time. So we are, it's very early days at the moment, but we're hoping that the impact of Turnaround will um, obviously have a, have a positive impact on their first time entrance. So that's, that's the, the key, the key um, bit of work with, with the Turnaround Project. Sorry, and, and how many uh, is this now being um, used in all schools? I no, mean, this isn't. No, this isn't. No, sorry, this isn't a schools um, initiative. Um, this is a um, you know sort of criminal justice initiative in, in terms of one of. So there's a suite of um, activities that um, nationally is happening in trying to trying to bring down. Um, you know, to, you know, to, in terms of tackling diversion, and um, to turn around as one of them, engage is another one. When you've got young people in the custody suite. Um, and there's, sort of, there's other things that, that are being developed at the moment. But though it's not a specifically schools initiative. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you want to ask? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, a particular big thank you to um, acting detectives. I'll get it right by the end of the evening. Um, Detective Superintendent David 
Blair. It's, um, it's a big issue, this. And uh, so, Jennifer, um, you mentioned perhaps in a year's time we might look at the FTE again and see, see how progress is being made. That's OK. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. All right, we're going to move on to item six. Yes. Um, it's our children's services quarterly monitoring. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Joe. We've got a very packed agenda, so I'm happy to be within the conference yes, and not yeah, being rude. Yes, that's fine. I'll be brief. I mean, I think this is, this is a... Um, a brief report, isn't it? I mean, it's our quarter one report. Um, from the chair, I just wanted to say thank you to whoever, thank you, <laughs> because we asked for the first page of the, of the report. We asked for all those details, and it is really good. So thank you for that. And I'll just hand over to you, Joe. for, are you going to do any, just say a few words? I'll let you you know what it is, two stars and a wish. So. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, there's just a couple of things, thank you, Chair, that I'll draw um, colleagues' attention to, because I'm mindful, hopefully, um, whether you like the report or not, you're familiar with the report, so you know, you know the, 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 the way it flows. Um, so just a couple of things I'll draw attention to. Yes, there was the request, and I'm going to make it an annual um, sort of standing item, that every time we do the quarter one report, it's the first report you receive after the January school census, which is very much a really useful intelligence source for us around the demographics of the children. So that will just continue to be a standard quarter one update for you to give you that sort of general context. So when we sort of throw out figures, you've got some sense of, oh, when they talk about EHCPs, we're talking about this many children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a couple of things I was just gonna draw attention to. Um, there was an action or a request from last time, so we don't necessarily need to go through the detail unless anyone's got questions, but um, colleagues had um, a couple of queries um, last time with regards to some of our SEND activity. So, as you know, we have a standing item in the report that draws your attention to the work that we've been doing and the monitoring work around improving our timeliness of the um, EHCP. Um, assessment. So I'm very pleased to say that for about the third quarter going, I can confidently say when I've been sort of saying it's slow and steady increase, we are continuing to do a slow and steady increase. So the last formal um, measure that we've got is the quarter one figure, which is cumulative for the, for the year 56. I can say hot off the press, our figure for July was 70%, our figure for August was 74%. So year to date, we're running at 62%. That puts us significantly above, and I don't use significantly in the purest math sense, but in the sort of common sense sense, that puts us way above London and England. So we're not complacent. As far as we're concerned, if we could aspire to 100%, we would. But I think we just want to give that reassurance, the service of committed, and obviously when Trace was here previously, dies come as a head of service, that absolute dogged determination of the work that the service are doing, it is starting to reap the rewards and they will keep absolutely on it. I'm not gonna sit here and say we're not gonna get the odd blip, but at the moment it's absolutely consistently moving in the right direction. I'll just take the opportunity to, to welcome Vicky, Vicky Cuff. So as you mentioned, uh, Tracy, Vicky Cuff is our new um, Assistant Director for Inclusion, Learning and Achievement. Some of you will know Vicky, who was the head at Invicta. So uh, Vicky's now in that mantle of driving forward this, this performance with the team. Yeah. Um, and the other request just linked to that was um, members were interested in, for those that exceed 20 weeks, some sense of to what extent they exceed. So are we having numbers of plans that are sitting there for sort of 52 weeks, etc. So I added in a table which is on page 133, which was just a bit of a snapshot to look at the activity year to date. Um, so the figures that we're reporting in quarter one was 101 plans. So what I'm trying to demonstrate there is, yes, we only achieved potentially 56 within the 20 weeks, but you'll see it as the sort of the time scale progresses into sort of 21 to 30 weeks, 31 to 40 weeks, the numbers drop off. So yes, we want to shift all those numbers to the left, but we just wanted to give some reassurance. There are very, very few plans that are exceeding 
the 20 weeks by a significant amount. And I know for a fact the three that went that long had exceptions. So that's not an exception, but those are the ones that are recognised that we can put a tick that says there is an exception, which either means a big period of the um, data collection and analysis maybe coincided with the whole of the six weeks holiday, or it's a very complex case where it's acknowledged the important thing here is to get the right plan, not a quick plan. Um, and again, the reassurance as we've given before, funding is released schools at the point that schools need it, not when we sort of do the tick the box, here's the plan. So that just, I just wanted to reassure we'd, we'd picked up that action item. The other thing really just to draw attention to since we met last, the, um, we've obviously had the summer of um, examinations. Officially the DfE's line, it is the first full year of return to whatever we call normality. Um, so I can actually share, um, Key Stage 2 data was provisionally released yesterday, so we had a sense, unlike Key Stage 4 and 5, that data doesn't flow through the local authority, so we're very reliant on schools sharing headline messages, but we can't actually do any purist analysis. All the primary data flows through us. So I'm actually in the position to say, because it was, it was published by the DfE yesterday, the provisional position for Greenwich, I'm pleased to say, is very, very positive. So for the key headline measure of the proportion of pupils that achieve the expected standard in reading, writing, and maths, we anticipated we would be in line with 2022, which was 67%. That is what the provisional data shows. It may creep up a little, because there's going to be a whole raft of re remarks, regrades, there will be some schools that will still apply to remove children from the performance tables. And just as a reminder, what that means is that's not wiping those children's results. So those children's results stand for those children, and it's exceptional results for some of those children. But it's recognising that schools get scrutinised publicly by performance tables. And if a school has been very inclusive and taken in, say, um, overseas children at the end of year five, they've literally got almost two terms before those children have to sit assessments. It is not right that they are publicly scrutinised if those children do not ex you know, exceed the census. So there will be a little bit of removals coming out. So at the moment we provisionally sit comfortably above London and England on that measure. And then for the higher standards, this is the children that are going above and beyond in terms of the expectations. We are provisionally in line with London at 12%, and that's a bit of an uplift on last year, and we're above England. So really, really positive progress. It's a bit too early, so that's around the journey, regardless of starting point from Key Stage 1 to Key Stage 2. It's too early because the DfE literally published the methodology for that yesterday, and as much as Tiernan, who some of you have met, is a genius, it's a bit unfair even for him to put him under that pressure. But um, we anticipate that will probably be a very positive picture as well. Um, so great news. Um, key stage four or five, nothing's in the public domain. So I think the most we can say here is um, many of our schools and many of our children have absolute right to be very, very proud of themselves this summer. The party line nationally is there is an expectation that published results will be back in line with 2019 because there will still some quirks in the system for 2022 where it wasn't sort of a comp So the DfE are sort of saying, expect anything that gets published to be in line with 2019. So it's just a sort of precursor when that data comes out. If there's any comparisons to be made, that's kind of where we need to go back to to say it's a fair and true comparison. But we're very confident. Some of the phone calls and conversations my team were having with schools over the summer where they were sharing stuff, you know, they're very, very proud of their results this year. So I think that's just a nice positive to, to end on unless anyone's got the rest of the report is very much what you're used to right Joe thank you very much and actually some of that um, I, I really can share the celebration of the exam results and especially the key, key stage two that's something that we all are very proud of my only question was around the special educational needs which you've actually covered um, and I did want to comment on the um, education healthcare plan where you put that little table there. Um, it, is, it is awful when you, when, you, when you know that children are waiting a year for an education healthcare plan, but then we all know that each individual child is different. And if we're looking at three children there, um, 
then those are things that we can actually manage. We can manage that. It was a lot more than that before. So I think we are looking at a picture that's gradually improving, but we are still looking at it. So thank you for that. I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Chair. It's just actually going back again, uh, talking about the, the plans, the, the education. And yes, there are three um, that exceed the uh, 52 weeks, but I was looking at the, and I'd, excuse me if we've, you've already covered this, the 15 plans that took 31 to 40 weeks, and 40 weeks is getting sort of higher number, isn't it, of months. Um, and I refer to this uh, because, well, so last week, or was it last week, um, within Eltham Library, um, a consultation was had, a first consultation about the new centre facility that may happen um, on Bexley Road. And, and we were talking to individual, I know Councillor Morrow was there, individual people who were still waiting for plans. And you could see physically how, how the carers and the parents were very, very traumatised and some very sad cases. Yes, yeah, so I'm just looking at that, keeping that, bearing that in mind, actually talking to those carers. That's the first time I've actually spoken to carers and heard their distress and their situations. I'm, yeah, I'm just looking at that figure of 15, 31 to 40 weeks. You are, yes, we're getting there, I understand, but we've got to keep this in mind, haven't we? Absolutely, and all I'll say, because, yeah, we, we've sort of said this in the past, it is a partnership mm. um, challenge where EHCPs, we are, if it was, and this is no disrespect to colleagues but, and, and partners, if it was just within our gift, we would be in a much firmer position to say it is within our gift to try and affect that figure. But there are so many complexities mm. that come into this in terms of children that need um, specialist medical assessments. We've talked before about the national shortage of ed psychs and things like that. So I think the way the service and we are seeing it is the figures are going in the right direction. We would rather them go in that direction quicker, but better to be on the improving journey we are. And yeah, if Di was here, she would be able to, she would know who those children are and say, well, unfortunately, you know, six weeks of that may have been the summer holiday. And we can't use that as an exception on every case because everyone would be doing that. So there's nuances on every question. But yeah, our aspiration is those figures, like I say, shift to the left. And we're taking some confidence yeah. in the fact that's what we're seeing. But you're right, every child in the same way as examination, that every child is, is slightly different. And I think, again, for us, the right plan, as difficult as that can be sometimes, is better than a rushed, poor plan. Um, but that is a hard balance, and I get when, it, when it's obviously individual cases. Okay, thank uh, you. I mean, I, I just would like to add to that. I mean, this has been the, this panel's focus for some time, and rightly so, I think. Um, and, you know, we, none of us need to uh, describe the anxieties that families feel at this time. I think that's all too apparent. Well, I would like to turn it on its head and say things are obviously happening, despite the fact that we know that interagency work is difficult, that there's a shortage of ed psychs. So something that we're doing in Greenwich is actually working. I just wonder what, you know, it, it, something somewhere has happened to actually make an improvement. It's not a huge improvement, but it's going in the right direction. So it'd be really interesting if you, you want. The, before I was just going to say the other thing for colleagues, and it's not again an excuse, it is going in the right direction in a backdrop of disproportionate continued increase in that cohort. So the service and partners are improving and the figures aren't staying flat. So we're actually seeing improvements with more children than the system. So I think okay. it's just the context of that. That's that sort of double-edged source. If we were just plodding along, but numbers were pretty the same, we probably wouldn't be quite as, you know, confident. But. Thank you. I think I can't remember the exact numbers, Joe. You might have them, but I think it's about 700 increase from 2019, 700 increase of children on EHCPs. Um, one of the things we did about six months, a year ago, was increase the capacity and increase the size of the teams, both in the EHCP team, the SEND team, but also education psychologists. So we have increased the capacity 
of the services. You, we have yeah. almost 300 more per. Really increasing, yeah. Um, and they've had time to processes. And We've developed a dashboard to try and keep a track on, on everything. So it's a logistical kind of exercise as well as working with our partners. And I think the inspection showed that the partnership work is really strong. So being able to work well with our speech and language therapist in Oxley's and strengthening that partnership all the time, not taking our eye off the ball at any time. What I'm pleased about is that it's incrementally going in the right direction rather than spiking up and down. What I will say is that what you've done, I think, or what we've done, is highlight this, plug at it, and then make it an absolute priority. Um, and, and it's gained results by, by uh, employing more staff or diverting more staff into trying to sort this out in a climate um, when this you know, shouldn't be happening with, with lack of resources. So we keep our eye on this, and I think you know, next quarter we'll look again and see and make sure that's still the case, but that's good news. Thank you. Can, yes, Can Councillor be, Greenwell, yeah. question. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm sort of looking on, on page 129, actually. I don't know whether you know the answers to this yet, where it says 28% of pupils are known to be eligible for free school meals. Now, there's news at the moment. Am I correct in saying that the mayor has put aside money, a large amount of money, to give all primary school children free meals? What, because what I was going to say, look what the answer is. I don't know whether you have the answer. Does that mean that those people who are already eligible for school meals because they have a, prior, a higher priority will have some additional priority. Do you know what I'm trying no, to No, what all this literally means is technically who pays for the meal that's yeah. currently paid for. So the 29% are the children that enrol at a Greenwich school who are known to be eligible for free school meals. That doesn't mean it's every child. If some families choose not to um, apply if you've got a child in infant phases you get a free meal anyway so what effectively the mayor is doing is plugging the sort of the gap between you've got children that qualify because they meet the criteria of low income largely you've got children that qualify at the moment because they're in, a, they're in an infant class because infants get universal free school meals and they tend to be the families that don't apply and the schools do, I mean, schools, Vicky will know better, schools in Greenwich have got some of the most creative ways of getting families to apply because even if the child takes a packed lunch, it is a key criteria for that school that that is the demographic of that school and the school get funding for that. But a lot of families don't apply because they're in year two and they get a meal anyway. It's them remembering. So what that is about is the families that currently pay for a free school meal, for, sorry, for a school meal, if you're in a primary school, basically they won't have to pay for at least the first year, whatever. Um, so it won't change the underlying proportions of who is eligible. The caveat around those figures at the moment in terms of being as a, used as a proxy for deprivation, right or wrong, the government have been changing that because they've been trying to bring some protection into families because of the disruption of universal credit rollout. So at the moment, there's a lot of protection in the system for families. So technically, there are families in Greenwich at the moment who no longer qualify for a free school meal because, and the irony is it's probably because they're working two hours a week extra, but they've tipped over. They are protected till the end of their um, school phase. So the figure is as reflective as it can be, but they're not quite that purest figure once upon a time that that figure reflects mm, mm, that cohort. Mm. It's, it's a bit of a mess. But yeah, what, what the mayor's doing won't change that at all. It just means basically the other percent, if you're in primary, are not paying for that meal. I, I would like to ask a question about the free school meals, and perhaps Florence can come in on this. We do know that the, the mayor of London has, has made this edict, but we do know that this isn't going to be funded forever. One year. And then what? And then the question is, you know, what happens? So, you know, that's a big question, I think, for a wider audience. But I don't know, 
And just to say, there has been some modelling. I've been had various conversations with finance colleagues, and to their credit, they have thought to come to us and seek, because them understanding, actually, the, the, the bit you need to model is that intersection of these ones get it for free, these ones currently pay. So you're not funding every child, you're funding that one. And that's quite a key thing so that you do your maths correctly. You're, you're not funding everyone in the system, you're funding these. But I think the, the challenge is trying to, and, and, and Jane would speak to it if she's here, and I'm sure Deji will have it in his head, is it's all the associated costs. If suddenly every primary child is eligible to have a free meal and all choose to accept it, that's hundreds of hundreds of extra children you've got to have plates for, cups for, cutlery for. So that's been, I know, one of the challenges across London of pushing back. And look, there are authorities out there that fund and have shared some really good insight about the capital investment that's needed alongside this that, to my knowledge, isn't funded. No, um, so it will be interesting to see what happens in a year. But the precedent has been set, how do you tell a family? I mean, we, we struggle with how do you tell a family that you can have a free meal in year one and year two, but as soon as your child moves into year three, you have to pay. It's, it's a very difficult conversation for schools, and schools carry the brunt of having to have those tricky conversations, and I'm sure schools will carry the brunt of, in a year's time, you've got to start paying again. Thank you. I mean, you, you would like to think that there's some plan somewhere, that someone is thinking strategically about what happens, and financially, what happens after a year, um, because, um, you know, it, it, this is not what we're discussing tonight, but when free school meals come up, there is, there is this um, change that we need to be aware of. So um, open up to the panel if anyone else has got any questions. Joe, I think that's great. Thanks very much. That must be the shortest one you've done. You do a lot of work. Thank you very much, Joe. Excellent. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Callum. So I wanted to uh, thank you very much. That was great. You covered some of the stuff I'd flagged before. So, yeah, thank you. And I did have a question, but Linda asked it, so you're free. Um, <laughs> I wanted to apologize for my lateness. Um, and I've also... I've been asked by uh, Lade to apologise, to send her apologies and her apologies for late sending of apologies. <laughs> so the double apologies. Okay, right, we're moving now on to the school place planning report. And um, Ayodeyi, I think you're welcome. I think, I think we've met once before. Um, yes, indeed. Yeah. 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 Now, um, what we do here is we assume that members of the panel and the people in the room have actually visited the report. Um, we don't ask you to read it, read it. We don't ask you to go through it page by page. But maybe from your point of view, if you want to pick out two of the key factors that, that you're pleased about, maybe, or that you're comfortable with, and maybe something that you would like to discuss further or something you would like to see improved. So it's like two stars and a wish. That's the way we work. So that um, then we can open up for questioning. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just to say that this report uh, was originally meant for cabinet. And um, you know there are some recommendations in it uh, that um, we don't need to make a decision here. So this is just for information. Uh, for example, uh, paragraphs 1.5 1, 1, 1. to 1.7. Uh, so just to note that. And so generally, um, this, we plan our school place, school places in the primary uh, based on prime primary areas. Uh, planning areas. I hope you have got the appendix uh, that is attached to this report. That presents uh, the data uh, for the pl primary uh, planning areas. And if we open to page number three there, that shows uh, the six planning areas that we um, use in planning for our primary school places. So that's in the data, that's in the data annex. Uh, I will refer to it a, a bit later. 
Uh, so generally in the, plan, in the primary uh, phase, most um, areas across the borough are expected to see uh, a declining uh, demand for school places and over the medium term. And we plan over the five years uh, medium term. And uh, we are keeping an eye on the primary um, uh, sector to make sure that uh, the number of places available uh, is, um, you know, uh, not too much, and it, it's able to sustain uh, those schools, maintain a, a healthy balance, uh, pretty much in the primary sector. In the secondary, um, our latest projection indicates a broadly stable uh, outlook for the secondary over the forecasting period, and uh, the rate of demand will be affected by a range of factors, as we know, um, lots of things, including cross-border movements and all, and uh, parental preference for uh, you know popular schools, and they look at performance and all that. So that uh, impacts on 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 the you know um, the the demand for school places, and we plan our secondary borough wide. We don't use planning areas for secondary because secondary. Uh, aged children are able to travel wider, and uh, parental preference also suggests that parents want their children to travel wider to where they think, uh, you know, uh, they want them to have a good education. So in the, in, in, in the, sixth, in, in the specialist uh, place, uh, you know, uh, pl uh, planning for specialist places, uh, the, 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 the demand there shows that there's an increase in demand for specialist provisions, uh, especially for those children that have been diagnosed uh, with um, autistic uh, spectrum disorder. And we are seeing particular need um, in, uh, for those children that have um, uh, you know, special needs for, they have educational needs, uh, you know, complex educational needs. So um, because of that, we have allocated most of our capital resources to meet uh, the growing demands in, in, in the uh, specialist, uh, uh, you know, sector. So that, that's just generally uh, the summary of the report. In the sixth form, you know, uh, we, we hope that we will continue to be able to meet the demand in the sixth form because um, the uh, we, schools um, generally will, you know, expand their sixth form provision for financial reasons, and it helps us as well as a local authority to be able to meet that demand. So we don't have any problems in the uh, sixth form sector. So, so in terms of capital, um, you know, in terms of our plan to meet uh, the growing demands for second for for the sixth sorry for the uh, specialist uh, uh, provisions. We are bringing forward a proposal to uh, establish an all-through school um, in the borough, and we we were planning to have an all-through school on Hargo Road, which was the uh, former site for primary uh, for for Kibrook Park Primary School on Hargo Road. Uh, but due to the initial um, assessments that were done, um, that site would not be sufficient to uh, manage the whole school. Uh, so we are only going to be able to deliver the secondary and the, and the sixth form provision on that site uh, whilst we uh, consider, uh, you know, the options that are available for primary, for the primary provision. So that's just generally uh, the summary of the report. I, I, I hope you, uh, would, you would have read it, and if you have any questions, I hope I'll be able to, uh, you know, answer them, yeah. Thanks ever so much, and I think you've probably covered this question, but actually, speaking as someone who worked in education a long time, a cut in pupils in a primary school means a cut in budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at, if I'm right, is that we are looking at a falling role in primary schools. Therefore, we're looking at some of our primary schools. I mean, there's two alternatives, we either close a school or a lot of schools go down one go down by 30 children um, so and reduce their intake so the big question is this impacts immediately on the school's funding um, 
and we need a plan uh, to support schools and I think this is why we wanted to talk or I wanted to talk about this particular issue so I just wondered how far that plan if you if you, you can help us or anybody can help us how far that plan has got and um, you know what we might hear in the future thanks yeah, so generally, um, we, we have taken the view that closing schools is going to be the last resort uh, for us to consider. We have been having various conversations with uh, primary schools, especially those that are significantly affected by the falling roles, and we have uh, taken actions to reduce their numbers to a sustainable level. Uh, some of them um, we have already done, and some of them we have temporarily done with a plan to uh, make permanent in the future uh, so that such schools can plan with certainty in terms of uh, delivery of curriculum and um, uh, helping to meet the needs of the children as well. Uh, so we, we work hand in hand with schools, and, but we don't anticipate at this stage, we're not uh, recommending closure of any school at this stage uh, but we will continue to uh, monitor the situation to make sure that decisions, the right decisions are made in the future. Thank yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and I know Florence wants to come in, but um, I was just going to say that um, I do know that schools plan, I know that I planned on a four-year, five-year plan. And um, I think this is where we have concerns about um, schools who are experiencing a reduction in numbers, therefore ex experiencing a reduction in budget. Have we got a system in place, as far as the authority is concerned, to actually support these schools and um, therefore support the children in, in them? Because they will have done a development plan that spans over four years that doesn't take this into account. So all the plans that they put in place for curriculum development, for provision for the children, won't happen if they've got... So I just... I think my question is... Okay, I'll try and answer some of it. So we have very good forecasting ahead. So Philip, in the uh, same team as Deji, leads that work. So we know ahead of time in the pl planning areas what the building developments are, where the falls might be. So we have projections we buy into a pan-London sort of approach to the, those falling roles. Joe will know. It's in Joe's team, sorry. Not in Deji's team, in Joe's team. You'll see on page 163 the table that sets out the schools that are going to reduce their pupil admission numbers in 24 25. So we're already planning ahead for that academic year. You'll see listed there DeLucy, Fosdine, Horn Park, St. Mary, St. Margaret's, and Heronsgate. All of those schools will reduce by one form of entry. So that's planned ahead. Um, at the moment, uh, we, we are reviewing that and monitoring that. If we need to plan ahead further for 25 to 26, we might see that we need to reduce other schools or we might need to take the decision, and that would be done in consultation with members, in consultation with schools, to close a school or to repurpose a school. But at the moment, we're confident of the work we've done to plan ahead for 24 and 25. Um, and reducing those pupil admission numbers in those particular schools. Deji and the team have worked with those schools very carefully to, so they can plan ahead to reduce their teacher numbers and teaching assistance so they can, they can manage their budgets. Just to add to that as well, we make use of, uh, you know, any opportunity in meetings to, you know, bring place planning to the fore. Um, you know, with head teachers, with leadership of schools, uh, especially um, uh, during um, you know heads partnership and all that. Uh, so we 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 share this data with them, so they are able to know well in advance where our projections are heading, so they can appropriately plan their budgets as well. Yeah. I really appreciate that, and I understand it very well. And I'm sorry if I'm hogging the floor, but um, I want to come back on this, and I want to ask if I may, if we could have um, an update on, um, on the schools. I know that they will have lost staff. Um, we all know that. That's what the resources are. That means that those children may have lost support. Um, we don't know. So I, I think it would be nice if, if we could have um, a report 
as to how these particular schools are um, coping and what we've put in place to support them and um, you know just just how this reduction is going down the line I do have to uh, I suppose express an interest here because I was the head teacher at Linton Mead School. Now, I can tell you that that's a school on Thamesmead where the mobility was 46%. So that any one time, nearly half the school was mobile. The, the resources were fluctuating up and down. And yes, it went from one form entry to two form entry over a summer break and then another form entry the next holiday. So it went right up and now it's dropping down again. So when you look at that picture of one particular school, you can see how difficult it is for those children to perform well, for those staff to support when you've got to get rid of staff and you've got to cut the resources. Sorry to go on, but it's, it's a worry. And so if we could hear a little bit more about um, how, that, how that's going. And maybe, I don't know, Florence, if this is relevant in this meeting, but maybe we might, I don't know if the panel would like to do this, we might like to invite one of the head teachers or the leadership team from one of these schools to actually come and share any concerns they've got with the, with the scrutiny panel. Um, I would just, I would just put, that, I'll put that forward. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Use team really do do a lot of support with schools and where we've asked a school to increase their numbers and then they're now having to decrease we mm. help them financially as well so i mean it's, it's not your fault I mean, no, no, no 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 <laughs> but i'm just saying that we we do do a lot of robust uh, support to the schools um the challenge I, I'm, I'm confident that we've got 24 and 25 we've got managed we have got another challenge with 25 and 26 so we mm. are not being complacent about that at all and we will plan together for 25 and 26 as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Um, I'm looking at page um, 181 um, because I, I know that some time ago when we were discussing special educational needs, one of the priorities was places for girls with social, emotional, and mental health issues. Mm. And I can see that, you know, on this list, you know, it's, there, there is some mention, but it's to be confirmed. So there's no, um, there don't seem to be any concrete plans at the moment to actually expand provision for girls um, who we know are struggling mm. and often not in school, mm. mainly for that reason. So we'd hoped to uh, get uh, our bid to be successful to the DfE for uh, digital capital funding. Unfortunately, we weren't, and other areas were chosen. That might be because we've already got more special schools in our borough than many other areas, so that might be one of the reasons. Um, so the, the question really is about the capital funding to build a new school or to repurpose a school or to utilize another building. And at the moment, we're trying to do some work collectively with finance colleagues, with dress colleagues, to see where we might be able to identify some additional capital money. So we know the table lays out, I haven't got it in front of me, but the table lays out the capital funding that we have got for the expansion of a, a new school on the old Kibrook Park site, Hargood Road. Um, but uh, we haven't at the moment secured the capital funding for additional provision, but we're working on it. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, can I just, I, I'm looking at page 150, and again, I'm going back to this because it's regard uh, 1.6. It's to do with the, the new SEND facility, again, that um, I'm very aware of because I was there with uh, Council Morrow a few weeks ago. Um, and people were asking, actually, I know that this is for to provide 30 places for young people uh, send facilities after they've left school at 18 to 25. And people were asking, will my child fit into that sort of group? And can I, for clarity as well for myself, to actually, it's, you know, that is for send pupils with who send special education needs. But does that include, for example, 
ASD, um, as the SEMH, MLD, moderate learning difficulties, just to make sure that I know for future, if people ask and, and residents ask, which children would be eligible, or it won't be children, it'll be young people, to go to that facility. And actually what comes under the umbrella of SEND as well, which has sometimes become... Okay, so there, there's um, children who've got special education needs have support, and those are children that are in our schools that are getting some additional support that don't meet the criteria for an EHCP. And then there's children that are assessed that meet the criteria for an education health care plan, and those are the children that will be uh, eligible for this provision. So they will have had previously an education health care plan, our statutory responsibility for those children goes up to 25. So this is the statutory responsibility for young people with special education needs and disabilities who have had an education health care plan that we have to provide the ongoing education to them. At the moment, we do that through commissioning colleges or commissioning other provision, private provision. Um, so this will add our, to our capacity of being able to provide that education in the borough so they're close to home so we can work on independent skills as well as education at the same time. So, so you know, obviously, uh, you know the people with moderate learning difficulties. Do so they, most they, children with moderate learning difficulties will have an education, education plan. healthcare plan. Thank you. And if I could ask another question, um, Chair. Um, I think it's 4.11, we're told that there were 139 children who didn't have a place, um, a secondary school place in, I think it was in March. Um, and oh, they, they well done, because they do all now have a place. But I was wondering what pressure that puts on staff to be able to have to find those places do staff have to be taken from elsewhere or it must put an, an all night yes a lot of pressure on them so um we uh, we negotiate with schools uh, that are able to accommodate those children and schools are funded on the basis of the number of children that they have on their role uh, so, and the first census is normally around uh, the f October time. Uh, so, those schools will get additional funding to um, meet the needs of those children where they, where they have been asked to take additional pupils um, over their numbers. And what we also realize is that between the National Offer Day and the uh, time when children start schools in September, there's normally a churn, uh, which is about 10%. So uh, some, some of them may have gone over numbers between that time, but by the time children start in school, they are actually back to their normal numbers. So many, on many occasions, uh, those, those, some of those children find uh, other options. They, you know, parents make use of other preferences. Uh, some may choose to educate their, home, their children at home or send their children elsewhere. So at the end of the day, um, you know, some of those places do not get taken. But from, from in terms of funding and supports that are available for schools, they get funded on the number of pupils that they have on their role. We haven't had to ask uh, you know, staff to move from one school to another. No, we don't do that. So, so the, the, the schools will definitely have uh, the resources to take care of those children. And it's through those conversations that we have with them uh, that we can also identify additional resources where we've asked them to take on bulge, uh, an additional class. Uh, so those with the local authority can, can fund uh, resources that can be used uh, you know, for, for, for making sure that those children are um, you know, receive quality education in such instances, yeah. I didn't mean staff from the school. I actually meant your staff, the people who deal with um, placements, you know, the pressure on them. But what you're saying is, sorry if this is all right, Chair, to ask a supplementary. So do many schools actually um, 
what, right, uh, how, how many pupils sort of, uh, you know, is it a certain number per class that they will take? Uh, have we got an actual definitive number? Yeah, you're talking about in terms of, um, you know, number of pupils that can be in a class is 30, uh, 30 per class. And schools have what is called published admission numbers, um, which they can use to plan resources and, and curriculum delivery. Uh, back to your question on whether there's, you know, this exerts a significant pressure on our team, uh, definitely it does because, um, you know, more volume of work, but thankfully we've been able to, we have dedicated staff that are able to work over and above the normal, um, you know, routine to make sure that these children are placed and it, it sometimes entails calling schools, you know, uh, having that conversation with uh, uh, even neighboring boroughs. Uh, where we have a good relationship with uh, to make sure that these children are well placed. So generally, um, when schools agree to take over number, uh, there will be resources coming with those children so that they will have um, adequate uh, resources to employ or recruit uh, extra staff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Greenwell. I'm going to introduce uh, a question now, which is related uh, with Councillor. I think this is the question you want to ask us. In. Okay, okay, Councillor Mohammed. Yeah. Oh, do you want me? Yes, of course, Chair. I wanted to introduce a question Councillor Mohammed would like to ask because you may think that, you know, when we're looking at place, placements and admissions, um, I want to encourage Councillor Mohammed to ask her question, um, and it's based around our refugee numbers and the funding. So um, over to you, you Councillor Mohammed. Can I ask the same question first? Um, because I don't want to drift away from that. Um, how many cases do we have? Um, how, many, how many cases are actually taking us to court and challenging us, to, you know, um, you know, that either provision a base uh, or the what's the contents of the outcome of their assessment. How many cases do we have that are that are going through the court cases and actually becoming successful? Which means we are losing quite substantial money on legal representation from the um, LEA, where the LEA is concerned. So in terms of that question, that, that is for the SEND uh, review team, so assessment and review team. I don't have that number, we, we but I think, it. yeah. We do. We, We've got it on a dashboard. Okay. Yeah. We have it on the dashboard. Yeah. Our tribunal numbers are low. We, we know that. Um, here we are. Our tribunal rate right in 2022 was 84 tribunals. Um, so, yeah, Joe, our, you can... Our, the only, uh, it's, it's an area that the DfE could do more about to give us some context. Tribunals are quite a tricky data set. Obviously, a lot of it is very... Um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of information shared because obviously a lot of it is very personal. A lot of So even within the service, not everyone deals or is cited on tribunal data. But our rate of tribunals, so sort of relative to our population, is higher than England. Um, but the number of tribunals we've had has been broadly consistent over the last few years. So as Florence sort of said, we had 84 tribunals. Mm. Is that rate or tribunal? Or? No, that's the actual, that's the number and the lines of the rates. Okay, yeah. So we had 84 in absolute terms in the calendar year 2022. Um, and of those 84, when they went to tribunal, 26 were upheld, 25 were settled between us, and 33 were other. I'm not quite sure what the other... No, is, it was, this, this is DfE, it's probably not yet this is DfE settled. Language. So it will be some that are outstanding, some where it's maybe gone yeah. back for additional information. Sometimes parents will step away from the tribunal process yeah. and then maybe they still have the right to come yeah. back. Um, I think one of the challenges around this is we do get a higher rate of tribunals sometimes than perhaps relative to other boroughs. It's the, our, sec, our, our special schools are victims of success of being exceptionally mm. Good. good 
special schools. So one of our special schools in particular does have a proportionately high rate of tribunals because the outcomes for the children there, their, their outcomes across all four schools are brilliant, but that school has an exceptional um, profile. Um, we get lots of out of borough children naming that school hmm. on its, so, so. So these aren't 84 Greenwich children, they're, they're they could be tribunals where, from yeah. Lewisham, other areas who want to go to, uh, to our schools in Greenwich. Sorry, just um, following on, yeah. um, how many um, provisions are we paying for? So independent provisions that we're paying for? Independent, so you're yes. talking about independent. I'd have to, that, um, that, that, we have that data. We so do have about, it. Of our 2,700 EHCPs that we hold at the moment, the service, I wouldn't have it to hand, um, but the service, we have the breakdown of how many of them are in mainstream settings. So the vast majority of children accessing the EHCP access mainstream schools. That might be a mainstream school for DSP, it might be a mainstream school where their needs can be met. There will then be those that are within specialist provision, so the likes of Kings Oak, Willoughby, Waterside, etc. Then there will be others that go to non-maintained sort of specialist schools. Currently, as reflecting on the comment of the item four, we have very, very limited specialist, that additional specialist provision. So a lot of those children go out of, of borough, and that is a mix of other LA provision, a lot of it will be independent, especially particularly mm. for some of our children where their needs are so complex that we might only ever have one or two of those children at any point. We will absolutely have to find a specialist provider for that. But if you leave that with us, I can get some yeah. information off the, off the service. The DfE should be putting lots more of this into the public domain going forward because this January was the first time that the statutory return every local authority has to make every year when child level. So the devil is in the detail. If you don't know who the children are behind it, you can't do the stats. So we're hoping we'll have some sense of if we say X percent go to specialists, how does that how does that compare? But I'm happy to take that. I strategy. think it's on the Lear dashboard. It's yeah, because it, mm -hmm. it's basically we've got a London wide. Yeah, thank you. I'm, satis I'm satisfied with that. You know, we'll get it at some point. Moving on, my main question that's been bugging me um, for the last 10 days um, is that we have got, um, I think, the third or fourth Af Afghan family in the borough that's been placed in the borough by the Home Office. Um, now, I know the fourth one's already in process of landing and other outside organizations are dealing with the cases. What, we, what I have found out is that the Home Office pays financial packages to LEAs um, to support those um, students in schools, whatever school they go to. Now that financial package, I don't know exactly how much it is, I have written to certain um, organisations to seek that information correctly. Do we receive a um, financial package? How much is it? And how is that package being spent in our schools? What provisions are being provided by the schools with those financial um, package from the Home Office in order to support these particular Afghan um, ref refugees because it shouldn't be going elsewhere. That money should be going directly to those students. Now, I know schools are not actually, our local schools are not hiring um, what's called um, EAL, which is additional English as an additional language support person. So what is it they're actually doing with that money? That's something I, le I need to dig into and we need to find out.
I'm just, I don't want the, if you don't have the information now, I'm happy to wait to, for you to find out, but I know a financial package, Home Office is providing that across the board. To the school? To, no, to the local authorities for you to distribute to where the child actually goes. Okay, Ca and then the school has to provide the provision. Thank you very much. C could, could I make a suggestion, uh, Councillor, that we actually have a little report on that so that it, it can be shared across the panel? So we, you know, we've got, I think it's four families. Uh, four, yeah. Yeah, four families. Four families. Um, 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 the fourth one is just landing now. But there's it's a, in there's the a principle of for me. Uh, with being anecdotal about four families only, there's a principle here I think that we would all want to share about. We know that there's movement of people globally, and we know that we will get, we will, we'll be getting refugees. We also know that the Home Office are particularly reticent at uh, coming up with their funding for anything. So we, I mean, I think really it was to check that that we are actually in receipt of what we need to be in receipt of and that's you know it's that's, not come that's to my attention so that means so whereas ukraine families there is i know there's a grant and i i know that line and i know exactly where that that goes to that and that's given distributed to schools on the number of children that they've got but i don't know about any other grant i've not heard of that but it, so i will look at yeah, if we're not claiming, we should be claiming because if we're if these kids are being placed in our borough, then they risk, they need that support, and it puts pressure on our schools and our re and the resources. Thank you. That's that's great. Thank you very much for. Uh, I've got a couple, but I'll do them at once and kind of answer them as as and when makes sense. So, actually, linked to that, I did have a question: is about on in year how ready we are if there is any sort of you know, any shock surge in people as the you know as there would have been after the Russian invasion of Ukraine when there was a spike in um in Ukrainians um as well and then when it comes to things like the Afghan citizen relocation scheme which would be the pathway by which we would be getting Afghans now similarly you know if, if uh, where we are on that although I don't think we can expect any surge given how long the Home Office have been dragging their feet on that to the point that I know there are organisations, including that which I work for, the British Council, which are involved in trying to provide English language provision to um, Afghans in Pakistan awaiting um, ARCS um, approval. Um, I guess also, uh, so yeah, just a kind of a question on our provision on that and then in uh, on a slightly taking a step back, how, how well we are able to plan for additional support for children, young people for whom English may not be their first language. And that may just be about signposting other English language support that may be available um, to them. Um, and then to save me coming back, slightly separate um, set and going back on some of our earlier conversations. Um, is there anything you kind of want to say about why it is we see this increase in the number of SEND children um, what the drivers for that are? Is this just about diagnosis? Are there, you know, is, is there a trend for more diagnosis? Are we getting better at some of this? Or are we seeing a particular spike that others maybe don't? Um, and then on the school um, capacity of the school numbers dipping as well, uh, I think, you know, you sort of talked about the key way we try and support schools, which is around staffing levels. Um, and you know, I, I think it's, it's it's admirable that our you know that closures are the last response, and we will try to keep places open. Um, as part of that, do we support schools where we see a longer term decline in disposing of any other assets as a way of raising money? Because you know you can reduce teachers, but your facilities costs are still going to be the same if you still have the same facilities. And in fact, as we've seen through the past you know eighteen months those costs can be quite volatile as well with energy costs and so on. So is there anything else that we do to support schools to just have a bit more resilience there when they also downscale in terms of staff? So sorry, that was quite a few there. And you don't need to say something on every single yeah. one. Uh, I, I will take the ones I can answer and then we'll revert okay, to yeah, Florence where I can't answer them. So in terms of your first question, in terms of preparedness, 
for you know, any potential surge. Um, we plan our school places, um, and we, we, we have about, at least about 5% headroom uh, in our place planning. And we have seen, um, you would have seen in the report, uh, how accurate our projections have been over the past years. We have been able to uh, maintain that 5% headroom. And uh, in the primary at the moment, we are forecasting about 7.7%. Um, you know, which, which is about similar to what the Greater London, um, which the GLA is uh, projecting for, 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 you know, schools in, in London generally. So we should be able to manage in the primary sector. Uh, where the challenge is at the moment is in the secondary, where we have, um, you know, struggled a little bit um, for a particular year group in year eight and year 10, and we are constantly putting that under review uh, to see how we are able to support schools. And obviously, we want to maintain, uh, you know, a balanced, uh, you know, uh, number of places in school and not for it to overburden schools. So we continue to keep that under review. And schools have been really good in coming forward to help us in taking those children that we haven't been able to place in year eight and 10. And we take them through FAP, which is a fair access protocol. And, you know, where we have shared responsibilities and schools have been really, really helpful in, in taking those children. On the other question in terms of, of, of um, increase in the number of SEND uh, uh, places, uh, what's responsible for that? Yeah. So have we seen a spike at all, Deji, in, in the in-year admissions from the Afghan system relocation scheme or any other spike in-year? Um, not that's come to my attention. No, no, we haven't seen any particular spike as a result of that. Um, in the last year, we had about 153, um, you know, um, Ukrainian uh, refugee children of which we were able to place uh, everyone. Um, so it hasn't really significantly contributed to, uh, you know, the number of places that we have, you, you know, the, the demand that we have seen in India. But generally, we know that um, people move from country to countries, and, and we have seen a significant surge in in India applications generally, but not specifically due to the, you know, Afghan or Ukrainian. Uh, we've seen increases in numbers from. Um, you know, a country like Nigeria, for example, and, uh, but we, as I said, that 5% headroom in our place planning uh, has helped us in managing all that. Maybe you could say something, Deji, about the, um, the school numbers uh, when they drop the support in terms of disposing of assets, and I know yeah. you've done a lot of work yeah. on that in facilities. Yeah. yeah. So what, what we try to do to support schools, for example, we, we try as much as possible to be innovative, um, as I said earlier, closing down of a school is the last resort, especially given that when those places start to come back, um, it, it gives us that flexibility to be able to reintroduce those places where, where we can. Uh, so we have been working with schools to look at mixed-use opportunities uh, where we help them to uh, maybe uh, cordon off a part of the school and also help them to, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, reduce their cost as well. Uh, we, we have been working with our maintenance team as well where they can go into the school to say, for example, shut off uh, maybe, you know, gas supply to a particular area so that it doesn't, uh, you know, continue to rack up the bills where they are not using those spaces. So, and we have two feasibility studies that we are currently working on now in terms of options available for to particular schools uh, to help us make good use of uh, the space in there so that those areas that they currently use for delivering curriculum will continue to serve the purpose. Those areas that are not being needed will be you know, uh, mothballed ex essentially so that um, they are ready for reuse whenever we want to use them. So those are some of the things that we've been doing in that regard, yeah. The question about the increased number of children with SEND is a huge question, and I think it's a really interesting question. 
Um, there could be a number of hypotheses here in terms of how the brain develops uh, in terms of social communication, in terms of speech and language, in terms of use of media and screens, and how that might impact on brain development. Um, the impact of stress of children, of poverty and trauma could impact on brain development. I think in years to come, we might find that research is saying all those things. It could be nutrition and food and the way processed food it might impact. So, you know, we don't know at the moment, but there's certainly a spike or well, more than a spike and just increasing demand and increasing number of parents who want a diagnosis. And that also is contributed. So there's a cause and then there's also a response. So how parents are managing to deal if they're under a lot of stress and their child's behavior maybe is problematic. They might think that the answer is a plan um, and actually some good parenting work and some parenting might help as well. So I think it's a really complex problem, but I think it's an important one for us to ask and an important one to address. And I hope there's some academic research that's starting to look into why is it that we've got so much increase of uh, children with diagnosis of ASD and autism and ADHD. Um, yeah, so I'm afraid I can't answer it, but we know that there is a demand and we know that a parent's ex expectation is increasing. It, you know, previously, when the old days of statements, it was almost a stigma and a taboo to have a statement, and now it almost seems to be an access to a resource to have an EHCP. Um, the additional support for children with English, not for um, English is not their first language. I haven't got detail, but I do know all our schools do a lot of work. And again, Vicky, straight from. Sorry, yes, Nick. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. I realise this is slightly a political question, but looking at the Year 7 places and capacity and roles, it seems we've got surplus of could be as much as 10%, and certainly 5% on the actual numbers and the capacity of the schools. Um, we're having these plans for the new Harris Boys Academy, which is certainly going to skew everything in our numbers, our capacity, and it's going to affect some of the Greenwich schools, possibly, and also even just the gender balance, because it's a boys-only school. Do we have, uh, I realise it's, it's um, government policy, but do we have any input to the department to say that really, in effect, can we object to this because of the effect it will have on our own Greenwich schools? In, in terms of the Harris School in, in, in Avery Hill, I, I think that would help us to maintain. We need that school. We need that school. Yeah, because uh, as you would see from the admissions data, uh, I mean, more boys are, are located rather than uh, offered school places is because we have less school places for boys. And, and uh, we also, we've seen that, you know, Woolwich Poly Girls, when it opened, it further made um, you know, it difficult for boys. So what we did to respond to that particular um, you know, circumstance was to make um, Plumstead Manor a co-ed co school so that we can continue to maintain that gender balance. So we need that school uh, at the moment, so we are in support of it. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Um, and I was looking at our um, school's admission, which is the next item on the agenda, and it seems to me like we've been playing tennis between the two. <laughs> so, and Deji, I, if I can call you Deji, that's been a huge amount of work, and we really appreciate it. I mean, I, I know it sounds as though we're digging in there, but that's our job. Um, and we look forward to meeting you again at the next meeting. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. you for Thank everything. You. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to move on to, um, well, we're actually on to item nine here now. Uh, children's services, complaints, compliments, and representations. So, Gerard, are you going to go? Yeah. 
Nice to see you. Hello, Gerard. Hello. Welcome. I'm going to hand over to you because um, for me, this is just a report that we, we read through and I'd just like to hear how you're doing. Okay. Thank you very much. So on. Thank you. So I'll assume that members of the <laughs> I assume um, members of the panel have read the report, so I won't um, go through it in any great d detail, but taking um, leave from the chair about stars and fishes in an earlier comment, I will just highlight a couple of points um, which might be of interest um, to the panel. I think section three, which is um, table three, gives you an overview of the number of complaints which have been received in the last three years. Uh, and as you see, there's, it's relatively stable um, in terms of the overall number of representations. We've seen a rise in the number of complaints received under the Children Act procedures. Um, not substantial, but a small rise. We have seen a larger rise in the number of complaints received at stage two of the Children Act procedure. So it's gone from one for the past two years up to four um, in the reporting year. We have seen a drop in the number of complaints received under the corporate procedure uh, from, well, the table explains it, so I, w I won't read out the figures. And we've also seen a drop in the number of investigations undertaken by the Ombudsman. Now, the interesting thing there is that last year, the last reporting year, we had 33, and that was a spike. So we're, down to, we're at 17 for this reporting period, which is more or less in line with what we've seen over the last five years, give or take one or two um, points around the margins. The Children Act complaints, and I'm referring to Table 4, Paragraph 4.5, uh, we've seen a, a rise in the number of complaints that are either upheld or partially upheld. And we've also seen a decline, sadly, in the, percent, in the numbers of complaints that have had their investigations completed to t on time scale. So that refers to um, table 5, paragraph 4.8. So we've seen the rise in the number of complaints upheld and a drop in the time scales, in other words, in the number of days it takes us to complete an investigation and send a response to the complainant. Now, that we are intent, we've already taken some action to address that and we are now sending, when a complaint is allocated, what we used to do previously, which we still do, is we allocate a complaint to the service man, to the team leader or the service manager for an investigation. We are now um, copying in the strategic lead so they are aware that that complaint has gone to one of their managers. There are also, and we've done this for a number of years, weekly reports which are sent to DMT. So there's almost real-time monitoring of at what point the complaint is at, whether it's overdue, whether it's on, on time, etc. But we've, by adding the um, strategic leads at the point of allocation, we hope that that will, and be very reason to believe, it will result in an increase in performance around that area. Uh, what I would like to say in, in one of the impact areas around there is that we have had a number of historical complaints come into us of late. They seem to have come to us, they started to come to us after COVID, and I'm not talking about a historical complaint. It's a complaint that could be something that is, has happened 15, 20 years ago, that length of time. And the Ombudsman have given some guidance, but their guidance in the way they treat historical complaints is 
sometimes it's not always consistent. So what we have done is to develop a threshold document where we look at the complaint and make a decision as to whether or not we can conduct a meaningful investigation into that complaint and then either accept that complaint or decline it. But that threshold has been, has been devised having looked at previous ombudsman decisions. So in fact, we're trying to preempt because the ombudsman sometimes will say, no, you can investigate it, no, you can't investigate it, and there's no real consistency. So we looked at their um, judgments over the last, say, four or five years, and taken from that, applied a set of criteria as to whether or not we would or would not accept the complaint. So if, for example, if we decline the complaint, we will set out the reasons to the complaint why we are declining the complaint, and they are, they are then at liberty to take that complaint to the Ombudsman if they wish. Ask the obvious question. Why are complaints not time limited? I mean, how is it because there was COVID and people had time to sit around and think and then think, well, you know, I'm good. 20 years ago, I mean, it, it can't be in the right climate. They're, they're ch the Children Act Complaints Procedure are time limited. What they say is they expect you, the complainant, to make a complaint within a year of the event happening. However, the Ombudsman's guidance is, well, yes, that's all well and good, but we expect you to exercise your discretion. So if it's still possible for you to take a meaningful, undertake a meaningful investigation, we would expect you to do so. Councillor Mohammed, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Deeply concerning for me, um, but I just want to ask you another obvious question is um, these complaints, these historical complaints that you're seeing an increase of, is there a pattern? Um, I would say probably since COVID they have increased amount. They, they declined this year, but previously they have increased. I think people probably it's difficult to speculate, Councillor, because I don't know what causes somebody to initiate a complaint 15, 10, 20 years about after it's happened. The anecdotal evidence would seem to suggest that there are some triggers. So it might be that some, per some person, a former care lever, for example, or not necessarily a care lever, has gone through some form of therapy and that therapy has triggered their desire to make a complaint. It might be very often that there is a high profile case in the media and that triggers people into making a complaint or, as, and I'll finish on this point, or age, age seems to be related. So it's, for example, a lot of the complaints seem to come about around the time when people either have had their own children or their own children have reached maturity. So it's not unusual for us to get a complaint from somebody who's 40 years of age about something to happen to them when they were in care. So for example, or not even in care, they might say, you failed to take me into care, you should have taken me into care, you left me in an abusive relationship or in, in an abusive family 15 years ago and I've suffered because of that. Yeah, okay, but this is not unusual for any local authorities to receive this. Um, so it's, not, you know, we're not the odd um, local authority to receive this and it certainly ain't new to nationally hearing about things like this so uh, we can't dismiss it my, my, my opinion is is we cannot dismiss it so what, uh, what approach are we taking in order either to do an investigation I know it's hard to look back 23, 40, 40 years ago 20 years ago, 30 years ago but that we've, you know we, we knew as a local authority there could be historical um, cases coming out, you know, and there will be in future. So how are we, what approaches are we taking? What investigation is taking place? What, how do we address what went wrong? How do we put things right for future kids that are placed in care? I'm not suggesting we dis, I hope I didn't give the impression, Chair, that we dismiss these complaints. We don't. When we get the complaint, we look into it. We look at, to see what information we have available 
So, for example, we might not have the relevant case records on, on that case. The members of staff who were involved might very well have left the department. So you can't conduct a meaningful investigation if people aren't available to interview, for example. There might be a paupacy in the records. There might be missing records. Or, for example, somebody might, make, might be making a complaint of, and when we look into the case, we see that the matter went to court and the, the, the issue was determined in court. So if the issue was determined by the court, we wouldn't accept that complaint because we wouldn't investigate something that's already been adjudicated in a judicial process. But we don't dismiss them. I think that's the key point. And I'm not suggesting, you know, nor are we, I, not, I don't have to hand the figures that other local authorities have in historical complaints. But I wouldn't say that we are unusual. I'd be surprised if we were. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you very much. Do, do any other members of the panel have a question? This is a question, yes? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it, it's regarding safeguarding and social care. Um, we received, or you received 10,362 contacts to safeguarding and social care, of which 3,521 progressed to referrals. How do you make the decision and decide how a contact becomes um, a referral? What does it actually mean by contact in that particular sentence? A contact is any contact communication made into the MASH team. So people make um, contacts into the MASH. If it's then considered to meet the threshold for a referral, it is judged in that case. And the, the, the MASH team then will decide whether or not it should proceed. They, sh they would take further investigations um, and whether or not the case then perhaps be referred to uh, for an assessment for a child and family assessment. So not every contact, not every contact that comes in to MASH would be considered as a referral. Yeah, yeah. Well, th those are decisions that are made by the MASH, by the practice managers in the MASH team. On, on the day? On the day, yes. There's a whole yeah. team, there's a service that's very, very intensively, and they look at the database, they look at information. Some of these contacts will just be inquiries, they'll just be information, but we just log them all. So there's a whole range of different contacts. Some might be a school inquiry, some might be a, a police kind of Merlin that comes in, where they assess it, that it doesn't have any safeguarding concerns. That time. It could be all sorts of different things that come in. Well, is it a team? To get oh, it's a huge, a big team, yeah. How big? I can't remember the time from my head, about, what, about 20? It's about 20. About if, 20. If, if, you, if you walk down on a day when everybody's in, it's about yeah. 20. Yeah. Um, but I suppose if, if, if you think as the director was... Police and probation yeah. and health as well as... So as the director was saying, I mean, the, the, the MASH is our front door service. Mm -hmm. So everything that comes in to children's social care comes in through the MASH. It doesn't mean that it needs social work intervention mm -hmm. or, further, or further assessment. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Jared, for the report. Um, my question's about kind of complex complaints that span numerous... I, do you call them directorates? Directorates, I used to work in a role where I managed complaints for a number of departments within an NHS trust. And um, it, one, of, one of the reasons we were constantly delayed on complaints was because we, our departments were really good at answering their complaints. However, then it would kind of all get a bit lost because there was no one central seeing through that complaint because the complaint was complex and spanned numerous directorates and had numerous different people answering the complaint and then it would all get lost, and then the complaint response would never really get put together and never actually get submitted, and, um, and sort of we'd say, well, we've done our bit. That's, that's with another directorate to now answer their bit, and it all got a bit lost, and it was one of our reasons why we had particularly long complaints that hadn't got a response. And I guess my question is, how do you navigate that with an, I guess, almost quite a similar setting where, you know, you as children's services might have answered that complaint, but actually you're waiting on other directorates to answer theirs. 
In terms of children's services, all the complaints are managed through the central children's complaints team. So, for example, when we talk about compla complex complaints here, what we're referring to, a complainant might raise an issue in the one complaint about some element of social care intervention. There might also might be an element of, uh, oh, and by the way, um, my EHCP plan hasn't been issued to time or the needs assessment letter hasn't gone out. And they also might have an issue, uh, a reason to complain around uh, our inclusion service, so say behavior support. What my team would do, what my service would do, is we would, we would collate those responses from the individual uh, services, and then the complainant gets one response. So they don't get three or four responses from children's services, they get one composite response. In terms of um, adult, um, say like housing, for example, sometimes we will actually, add, if as far as possible, we can get a response from our housing colleagues. And bear in mind, you could be dealing with complaints that relate to different complaint procedures, because you could be in the Children Act arena with a complaint, or you could be in the corporate arena, or you could. So, if if it's to do with housing, we will ask housing, and very often they come to us for a, a contribution. If we get the response, and we will chase that response, if we get the response in time, we will send it out, or what we will do is we will send a holding letter to the person and say, well, this is a partial response. We are waiting for our colleagues in housing to follow up with their response. Sometimes it's better to split them, councillor, and say, we will respond to the children's issues and we'll housing will respond to the other issues because there are different pathways. So for example, if the complaint was unhappy with the response, they might, for, and they wanted to escalate it beyond, say to the ombudsman, there's a social care ombudsman and there's a housing ombudsman. To, to the different pathways. So you might have to split them. We try not to because we're conscious that it's better that the complainant gets an aggregate composite response from the council as one. And, and I just think also just want to note that I think it's really admirable in terms of the amount of complaints that get de-escalated because um, I assume it's service managers who are involved there just to say I think that's that's really good because I know how difficult it is when someone wants to, to go down the formal route to actually give them a sufficient answer or response to their complaint more actually or it's remedied in such a way that it can be dealt with informally I think is, is should be uh, remarked as, as something positive. Uh, thank you for that. I think, Chair, what we do is we work closely with our advocacy service. So if an advocate raises an issue on behalf of a young person, then we will seek to resolve that directly with the service to prevent it escalating into, into a complaint. And if there's any actions that are agreed, then we will monitor the implementation of those actions. I'm very interested in the link with the advocacy service. Um, uh, around around these complaints and I think it'd be, lo it'd be good at some point to hear some more about that but I wanted to echo Councillor Bacon's comments I mean this is phenomenal and um, thank you Gerard for your time and this report and all your staff Councillor yeah sorry just very quickly uh, three things uh, one, uh, how much has that uh, on these those historical cases, have we returned more to a norm now? As you said, there was a slight sort of COVID spike. Oh, the last six months we haven't had any. Okay, the last six months. We so we're back to sort of yeah. that was a, a short term. But it does of, take a considerable amount of time to investigate yeah, no, no, or of course, to see of if course, you have of course. enough information to conduct an investigation. It, it's not. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. of course. Um, and then just briefly on on. In the appendix too on some of the learnings from the complaints I think yeah things like the tracking mechanism that's come forward that's a really fantastic thing that I think yeah good thing that we've learned one thing that I would just want so on the second uh, one in the on that uh, appendix to the second issue down one of the actions highlighted was um, about needing to improve staff training needs and quality assurance now I wouldn't ask you to comment on a specific one to make sure things could be kind of confidential but where you do identify that there might be deficiencies in in staff training and so on how how do we go about making sure people are properly supported and able to do their job 
and manage the complaints process? Um, and what were some of the kind of deficiencies picked up in terms of the training and guidance that staff um, were given? Again, if going into that risks getting into the specifics of a particular case, of course, don't do that because we need to make sure that the confidentiality is there. But I, I can give you a broad answer in two levels. If it's um, something that's particular to an individual member of staff, then we would expect that their um, team, their manager, would address that with them in the normal one-to-one -one supervision development thing. If it is something more systemic, then our approach to that would be, and I mean systemic to the service, so say for example it was a practice issue, then there would be a meeting with the service, uh, be it a meeting convened particularly for that purpose, or more usually, at their regular team meetings, they would get feedback, well, you know, this is an issue which we have looked at, we have needed to change our policy, and therefore your practice needs to adjust to that change. And kind of to that, how often would we sort of, I mean, for want of a better way of putting it, look at auditing our own effectiveness on that to identify where there might be some, you know, system issues that we can improve? Obviously, there can be proximate issues to an individual, and that's, you know, as you say, dealt with by the kind of line manager pathway, but are we, you know, do we kind of audit ourselves on some of that or do we more look to the learnings from ombudsman's reports and so on? Mostly it comes from the ombudsman reports because they do in-depth reports, but we also have our own learning which doesn't reach the ombudsman. So for example, when we have um, stage, well, when we have stage one reports, uh, investigations on stage two or stage three, those particularly stage two and stage three are fed back through the service to the service leaders at a senior level. We also have uh, quarterly reports which go to the directorate management team which highlight any themes that are coming out that we've identified over the previous quarter issues of practice, issues that need to change, and that goes to DMT, and therefore the assistant directors at the DMT would take those issues back to their respective divisions. Thank you very much, Gerard. And, you know, there's a lot in there. Um, piece of really good work. Thank you very much. I want to move on to item 10, because this panel is renowned for being sharp and we, we've had a very busy evening. So I'm going to move on to item 10. Additionally, the panel looks into, um, uh, does a deep review into one aspect, but before I look at the new review, I want to make a few comments about our previous uh, review, which uh, the panel undertook, into the um, transition between year six and seven and that has been completed obviously and has been actually taken to cabinet and all the recommendations I'm pleased to say have been accepted. I'm going to take issue with um, something in this uh, in the recommendations and that is uh, I know people probably haven't got this in front of them but one of our strong recommendations from the panel which has been accepted by by cabinet was we 11.3 we recommend a focus on retaining our brightest pupils in the borough and addressing the issue of the 11 plus selection out of borough we know that we strongly recommend that this is done by establishing an annual education fair to promote and celebrate the excellent work in our schools um, this could be facilitated using key public spaces across the borough at the same time each year now I want to just stress that point because I want to celebrate that recently, last Tuesday, um, we had a very, very, very good event to celebrate our senior pupils, who, especially in the schools that have shown such a lot of improvement. That's a, an amazing event. However, that is not the same as this event that we're recommending, and I'm, I'm very keen that we don't get confused about the two. The panel um, on the, in this recommendation are actually looking at the transition between year six and year seven and what goes on in our schools and, act, and providing at year 
four, as it says in 11.1, year four or year, beginning in year four to provide knowledge of what's happening in all our great schools across Greenwich to prevent pupils from leaking out to Bexley and other, and other boroughs. So the idea was that we would have, as we have um, apprentice fairs, as we have other affairs across the borough, that we would um, emulate this with education and that our schools would have the opportunity to actually say it as it is to parents in a library um, in three different areas. But that requires discussion and requires planning. So I'm proposing that perhaps we um, look into um, setting up a meeting with perhaps the head teacher's strategy group and Florence, who, you know, Tim and um, the head teacher of um, Woolwich Poly Academy and um, Thomas Tallis, maybe. But this is just my idea. Um, so we already do that for young people, and we had an event just last week for all young people from uh, year six to year seven. So lots and lots of young people finding out this? about school. Where was it? Where was yeah. it held? Yeah. Um, I don't can't remember, but Matthew led it. I can't remember where it was held, but it was de definitely definitely yeah, yeah, held. Yeah. What we haven't yet been able to do, and what we haven't done, is a similar with um, parents. So we've done it for young people to introduce them. Um, he, I can't remember exactly where it was, but he was talking to me about it and how um, amazing it was and how busy it was and how many young people were there. Um, so well, I know we I think, do I think, it. I think we'll take this out of this meeting, I think, and discuss this because I think um, the panel have spoken about this. So um, we, let's we look at what's happening. We can only organise so many things at a certain time. So yeah. we did, the, you know, yeah. it's a massive amount of organisation, these events. So we will plan for next year, but that was already in the pipeline. We did the celebration event, which took a huge amount of planning as well. We'll, we're now getting used to kind of doing that planning. We'll try and do another one for the next academic year. Mm. But the, we haven't done that particular action in this year, but it's all part of the school's partnership group to do for, the, for future years. Okay, thank you. That's, that, that. So I'll move on to our planned review um, that we're looking into uh, emotional well-being uh, of our children in schools and we're looking into schools to actually see how we can uh, improve this, if we can improve this. Um, just to update the panel, um, I had a meeting in August and uh, we had the scope of our review that we were going to take, which is, was too big. We were not going to... Um, so we've narrowed it down to just looking at schools because at first we were looking at young people but I think we're going to drill into um, actually focusing on schools to so scope out the work from there. Um, after conversations with um, directors over the summer, there's too much to, um, to take on board. For it to be productive, we're going to um, keep it smart. Um, so we're going to, the next plan is to scope out the visits and so panel members who want to be involved in this, if they could email me and let me know, um, we'll set up the scope, if that's okay. So that's about our deep reviews. Has anybody on the panel got anything they want to ask or contribute? No, that's good. So we come on to then um, our action monitoring report. Um, hope you've had a chance to see it, which actually is looking well, I think it's looking quite good, actually. Am I allowed to say that? I think, you know, most of the things I'm reading on here we're actually covering really well. So perhaps we need a few more actions. So we'll, we'll, soon, we'll soon sort that one out. So um, anyone on the panel want to add anything about that report? That's fine. So now we look at the commissioning of future reports. And so we've got um, fostering and adoption services. Um, in November and corporate parenting coming up in November um, which I'm quite excited about actually um, 
So I think that's just something to note, and I think that's just something we can accept. So I don't think now, you've got the dates of the next meeting, which is on the 8th of November. I just want to thank you for a busy and full meeting. Um, and it's not, usually our, um, it's not usually our remit to go past 9 o'clock. But um, well done, and thank you very much. Florence, thank you very much. Could you count, uh, thank all the rest of the officers? Thank you, Carl, because um, there's a lot of work there. That's great, thanks. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody.